we finally got a look at Scott Peterson and how he's been doing behind bars and what's about to come in this new quest for his innocence. <laughs> Hello, Silver Squad, and welcome back to the sofa. Sofa's back here. Roscoe's on it. He is currently shaking and bathing his two favorite things to do as a chihuahua. And my name's Paul, if you're new to the channel. Now, what we're going to be doing today is talking about a case that probably a lot of you are familiar with, and that is the case, uh, the perpetrator is Scott Peterson, and the victim is Lacey, as well as her unborn son. Now, here's what's going on, and we will do like a quick little overview. However, this is more of like just an update commentary video, because this case is so layered. I mean, there's entire channels and podcasts dedicated to this, right? So there's no way I could go into all the details here of it, right? But I will do a quick little overview for those who are not familiar with this at all. And so that's how I'll start the video off. And then we will look at some clips. We'll be reviewing the Innocence Project website, things of that nature. So just stick around. Now, if you do want to follow Roscoe, Pico Train and myself outside of the old YouTubes. We are on Instagram. So go on, check it out. Things on the screen. We're on the Insta, on the gram, on the Instagram. And it's also in the description below, as well as some other links to like my podcast channel and things of that nature. So, anyways, check that out and let's go ahead and talk about like that quick little overview. So Scott was convicted of taking the life of Lacey Peterson, his wife, as well as his unborn son. Now, she disappeared Christmas Eve 2002, and her body, along with her unborn son, were pulled from the San Francisco Bay like four months later. Now, Scott said he was fishing that day, it wasn't him. You know, he claimed his innocence. However, he was convicted. He was sentenced to the ultimate sentence, the DP sentence. Uh, however, he semi-recently got that overturned to life without parole. Now, where we're at for this video is the LA Innocence Project. Remember, LA Innocence Project, not Innocence Project. We'll get into that towards the end of the video. They have taken on this case, and they want to test new evidence. This is including items found in a nearby break-in, literally across the street. We'll watch in a second. And there theory is that basically they're going to prove that he was not, he meaning Scott was not the person who did this. And so that's what they're after. Now, with all that being said, again, that's a quick little overview, but let's get into like some of the nuts and bolts of what's going on. Now, very quickly, we're going to review a couple of articles on the screen here to use as like a basis for reference. This first one is from People Magazine. It's by Casey Baker, published March 12th, 2024. And you'll see at the top, it says Scott Peterson back in court after LA Innocence Project claims evidence suggests he did not take the life of his wife, Lacey. We're going to quickly review this one little clip from the article here to kind of just give us the very quick overview of what's going on with these hearings and whatnot. So it says a potential key piece of new evidence that the LA Innocence Project says it has is the existence of a van that was set ablaze on December 25th, 2002 in Modesto, the day after Lacey's 27 at the time, vanished. Peterson's lawyers claim the van is where Lacey's life was taken by two men after she witnessed them robbing a house on her street on the morning of December 24th, 2002, the day she disappeared. Now, inside the van was a mattress with what appeared to be bloodstains. The LA Innocence Project claims it has new evidence showing that the van didn't have a mattress inside it before it was stolen prior to taking Lacey's life. Now, let's look at some visuals, and we're going to look at a news clip for this, so you can get an idea of exactly how close this house was. I mean, it's literally right across the street, right? So let's take a look at this to kind of put us all on that same page. Detectives discovered there had been a burglary right here, just across the street from the Peterson home. One witness told police she believed that burglary happened the same morning Lacey disappeared. Okay, so for me watching this, and again, it's a, a memory also, because this happened, you know, obviously a long time ago, right? I was much younger. And then over the years, I've, you know, paid attention to the case, but again, I forget and whatnot. So the proximity of this house to their house is very interesting, right? Now, that doesn't mean that I believe in this theory and all that kind of stuff. But again, it's just, you know, another one of those little details that I was like, huh, interesting note taken. Now, let's go ahead and hear a little bit about what's already been done in regard to the evidence, and then we'll talk about it. Yeah, John, it's significant because the Innocence Project is highly selective with the cases they take on. Every new client they represent, they believe, could possibly be wrongfully incarcerated. Though at this point, it's unclear the totality of the evidence that lawyers wish to have reexamined. And based on what we know of so far, an acquittal is a long shot. Police ruled out those burglars as suspects years ago. And that mattress that we talked about in our piece, it was tested back yeah. in 2019. We reached out to lawyers with the project for comment, and they have not responded. 
responded yet, John. Interesting. So this is one of the things with this case that I find interesting, especially to the extent that it's been brought to with this, of, you know, retesting this type of stuff and whatnot. And now, don't get me wrong, before we go forward, I am all for dotting I's, crossing T's, holding the judicial and the legal and all those systems accountable, right? So these innocence projects that take these cases on and whatnot, 100% they need to be here, right? Yes, I do question the validity of them taking on Scott. Um, however, we'll get to some of that in a minute too, <laughs> especially when we review the websites and whatnot of Innocence Project versus LA Innocence Project, okay? But again, some of this stuff's already been gone through, so I'm kind of like, okay, like, why is this going on? Now, one thing though is the Innocence Project alleges that they have evidence from the van, over, a van owner that shows that the van didn't have that mattress inside of it before it was stolen, before what happened to Lacey. So you can kind of put two and two together where they're sitting here saying, well, wait a minute, there's this burglary in this van and the, the owner says that there's no mattress in it and then it has this in it. You see where I'm going with all this and probably where they're going with all this too. Now, again, it does seem like a big long shot. However, you know, he did literally get converted down to a life, you know, without parole sentence. Is that a long shot for that to happen in many of these cases? No, right? If you kind of hold out for a long enough time and depending on the circumstances, you can usually get these overturned. It's very hard. It, it takes a lot, in my opinion, to stay, to get a, a DP sentence and to go through all these systems and whatnot. And somewhere along the way, there's not going to be appeal or whatnot, but it happens, right? And again, if somebody, and this happens more than we would like to know, if someone is on, you know, on that level of sentence, everything needs to be made sure that, I mean, this is appropriate and that they truly are guilty of what they've done. Okay. I get that part. So to me, you know, I felt like the evidence in this case was overwhelming, but I mean, who am I? Now, the Court of Appeals has given a very small window of time for preparation for this to all take place. And during the recent hearing, there was a little bit of tension, especially from the defense team towards the state. So let's watch one clip here and kind of pay attention to it and see what they say. Go from there. Now, also, if you're listening in earbuds, because the volume on this was very tricky. So just kind of be warned here that it's either you're going to need earbuds for it or kind of brace yourself because it might get a little bit louder. So just, just be prepared is all I'm asking. Asking. Yes, Your Honor. We provided a very, very detailed uh, informal request for discovery on November 14th, four months ago. So the district attorney's office has known for four months which specific items of discovery we are requesting. We gave them references to Bates pages. We gave them references to where in the police reports the items we're requesting are, are referred to. We, um, we were very, very specific. We spent a lot of time trying to suss out what frankly are very alarming deficiencies in the discovery that was provided to the defense at the time of trial. Those are the items we're requesting. I agree it should not take 90, what, 180 days for them to find, locate those items and provide them to us. They were, they, the defense was entitled to those at the time of trial. Mr. Peterson has been waiting 20 years to find some of these police reports and audio recordings and video recordings that should have been provided. So I don't think that the nature of the request, it's not a fishing expedition. They're very precise, they're very specific, and we believe that they are uh, probably very easily accessible. So we would ask that, that they begin providing the discovery that we are entitled to under 1054.9. The prior 1054.9 that Mr. Harris referenced does not include what we are asking for. It related specifically almost exclusively to expert materials and other evidence that is not included in our motion. So we, we are eager to get our investigation underway and completed. The Court of Appeal did give us a very short time period within which to conduct our investigation. Uh, the materials we are asking for are, are reasonable. They're within the scope of 1054.9, and we would like to begin receiving that discovery as soon as possible. Well, go on, girl. I mean, she just got up there and started reading them for filth. Okay, so a couple of thoughts on this. Now, again, regardless of what my feelings are about Scott, his innocence, his get all that type stuff. Yes, if this stuff, like when these are the kind of things that we need to hold the judicial system accountable for, right? Because what happens is situations like this lead towards wrongful convictions and whatnot. So they're sitting here talking about 
he never got this evidence in the beginning in the first trial and now we're right back here what it makes me say why are they being weird with this what is up with this they should be able to provide this right and if they can't why why don't they want to or why can't they has it been lost do they never have it that type thing and again i'm kind of looking at it like this like there, it's almost like a checks and balances type thing and while again i just feel like i don't know what more you could do i mean there's so much evidence against him right but we'll get into what his original lawyer said in a minute and so many different signs of it you know i'm not sure what would help however again then when you think of these wrongful convictions and the same type of behavior goes on from the state and stuff where it's like oh whoops we don't have that we don't have that this is why it ends up being like well we, why not we need to have this why like holding people accountable that need to be held accountable in these situations now all this talk about the hearing and whatnot let's get to the juicy part okay let's get to the gossipy kind of part let's take a look at scott okay <laughs> let's get to the, the man of the hour if you will my gosh right let's look at a quick little montage of clips of him from the hearing he only spoke a couple of times right but then we're going to talk about him his appearance after that okay Thank you. And Mr. Peterson is present via Zoom. Uh, first of all, Mr. Peterson, let me can confirm. Uh, can you hear me and can you see me? Well, let me turn on my camera first of all. And we will unmute. Uh, can we unmute Mr. Peterson so he can confirm that he can hear and see the proceedings, please? All right, Mr. Peterson, uh, we're yeah. contemplating an April 16th hearing on the motion to seal the pleadings in or parts of the pleadings in this matter. Uh, are you going to want to appear via uh, Zoom or in person for that? Uh, yeah. Zoom is fine. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, then for hearing dates on the uh, DNA motion in the 1054.9, what's the party's preference in terms of hearing those together or separately? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, then... Um, Last housekeeping matter, the court did, uh, to the uh, court's department email, receive an ex parte communication from apparently some kind of a spectator. I read uh, about one sentence of it, enough to realize it was an ex parte communication, did not read any further, uh, and counsel have been provided, as I understand from the clerk, copies of that email. Did both counsel receive it? Okay, thank you. Uh, and the court uh, is not going to be reviewing any uh, incoming email to that inbox uh, in the future uh, to avoid that issue recurring in the future. So uh, people shouldn't bother to email. I guess before we get to Scott, I would love to know what that ex parte communication was, right? Because she's like, I read one sentence and was just done with this. I didn't read it, you know, whatever. I would love to know what that is, but that's just me, of course. But let's talk about Scott. Okay, so again, you saw just a few little words that he says. He's on Zoom. First of all, when he was like, I'm fine doing Zoom again, I was like... You know, if, if you watch this whole thing, I mean, it was just fumbling through the Zoom, which it always, it's, they, they never go off without a hitch. You know what I'm saying? All this talk in these days about, oh, AI is going to take this over, AI is going to take that over. We can't even get the ice cream machine to work on a regular basis at Wendy's, let alone these Zoom calls, right? And we want to talk about flying cars. <laughs> I'm just like, it's not happening, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> Just put a pause. Let's get a consistent working McDonald's ice cream machine at a Zoom meeting, and then we can talk about flying cars, right? But back to Scott, okay? He looks great. I mean, I'm sorry to say for those, you know, for those who are just like, ah, you know, they don't like him and whatnot. I mean, it, it shocks me how, you know, I, I don't know if it's time capsule or whatever. And it's also kind of angering, right? Because it's almost like, well, Mike, you look like you're doing great. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he looks, you know, he's 51. He doesn't look 51. So that part was wild. He just seems very calm and collected, you know, just like, okay. But again, he's been locked up for how long? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and doing this this game of this whole courtroom saga and all this type stuff so yeah his little ponytail which is angering for some reason i don't know why but it is but yeah he just seems very like yeah judge zoom's fine zoom's fine you know and on one part of it i mean obviously he's gonna want his freedom of course right i mean who want to regardless of how we might feel you know whether he's guilty or innocent but it's also something for him to do you know what i'm saying he's probably like sure we can do this what else was i going to be doing you know what i'm saying like literally like what else you know okay let's do it i often think a lot of times when there's like some of these cases that just look like there's no way they're gonna get out you know it's so obvious that they're gonna, like a jeffrey dahmer right i mean now, mind you if he was still alive why not file court motions you're bored you know what i'm saying so i'm sure some of that has 
to be going on here, okay? Now, let's do this. Let's hear from his original attorney and what he has to say about Scott's innocence. There was absolutely no forensic or circumstantial evidence to show when it happened, where it happened, how it happened. I do think that there's evidence that will exonerate Scott out there. I just don't know that necessarily it's been found yet or that it's been revealed yet. I will never forget the bombshell of when his mistress came out during all this with all the lies that he had been telling. While this is going on and he's over here talking to her on the phone during while he's also doing a, a press conferencing or a vigil and all this type of stuff, I, I can never get past that, nor can I get past the the run the absconding, right? Now, granted, he could argue that I was an innocent man being trapped. I needed to get freedom. Okay, I get that. You know what I'm saying? But there's just other things. The coincidences of it, all of it. Why wouldn't you have told her that you're going on the boat trip? The whole thing, right? It's just... Now, I understand what the lawyer is talking about. Well, there was never any direct evidence and there was never any of this. And it's like, you know what? Again, this is what, whether we like it or not, this is what defense attorneys are here for. To question the stuff, even though it can be very angry and sometimes. I feel bad for Lacey's family. I feel bad for those who truly love Lacey to have to be going through this. This is one of the things when we see these cases, whether it's Scott, whether it's the Daybell situation, whether, you know, any of these cases that victimize people, right? Their families and survivors of the crime are put through legal hell for years and oftentimes the rest of their life, right? It, it never ends. And no, think about Lacey's family. So how, how much longer? This was 2002, 2024, here we are, still in court. You know what I'm saying? Now, these are specific cases that are very publicized, so they probably really never go away for the family in that way. The media attention and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, that loss and pain is never going to go away. But I, I feel so bad for them having to continue to go through this. Now, what I want to do is go to the website. Okay, this is what I was talking about before. So, there's the Innocence Project and there's the LA Innocence Project. What we're going to do is look. I'm going to put some screen recordings up here and we're going to talk over it. First of all, we're going to go read the Google reviews on LA Innocence Project because they're good. Okay, so first of all, notice in the web search bar up here where it says innocencela.org, Los Angeles Innocence Project, exonerating the wrongly convicted, and you scroll down a little bit here, freeing the wrongly incarcerated, LAIP's mission is to exonerate the wrongly convicted, free the wrongly incarcerated, uncover and remedy the past misuse of forensic and other scientific evidence in the courtroom, improve standards for the use of forensic and other scientific evidence in the courtroom, and reform the criminal legal system to prevent future injustice. And then it says down here, you know, thanks to their donor, uh, founding donor, Andy Wilson, they provide pro bono investigation services and legal representation to indigent individuals in Central and Southern California who assert claims of innocence. Okay, there's that. Towards the end. So they, they really promote, um, and so we're just kind of scrolling through. You see down here, Los Angeles. So if we come back up here and we go to our work, what we do, and we're Salal Meet Science, and, you know, it kind of just goes back over this again, the advocacy and things of that nature. Now, it goes over to our clients, and their only client listed is Maurice Hastings. Now, this gentleman here, DNA evidence exonerated Maurice Hastings after 38 years. I mean, that's major, right? Uh, and it just goes into his story here and whatnot. And this is, you know, you see the pictures down here. And again, this is, you know, when you get this kind of stuff where somebody is innocent and it brings about change, amazing, awesome. Now again, under their mission, uh, correcting injustice, restoring dignity, uh, and it just goes through this all here. So, also look down at here at the bottom, where it says uh, the Los Angeles Innocence Project, California Forensic Science Institute. Cal State LA. So this is, you know, at Cal State, right? Okay, so now we've kind of looked through this. Now, one thing if you've noticed on here is there's no real signs of, uh, what's his name, Scott in here. Let's go to press even. Uh, covering our client stories. And this is just on the little website. Work of the news. Again, LA Times Editorials, 38, 38, Maurice. Uh, LA Weekly, Maurice. So, okay, got it. I think that's odd. Okay, so now let's go to Innocence Project. We're gonna get to those reviews in just a second, but I just kind of want to go over this. 
Okay, now look up in the bar here where it says innocenceproject.org. So different website, similar look, obviously, right? Uh, you know, with our work, issues, cases, news, take action about our team, careers, way more going on here. You can just see from these drop down menus, right? And we're going to look at these in a second. Issues, I mean, see all these, you know, false confessions, this and the other, blah, 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 blah. Our work. Uh, and we'll come back up to this in one second. Kenneth Waters exoneration, artificial intelligence, justice delayed, democracy denied, uh, Maurice w uh, Williams, or I'm sorry, Marcellus Williams, uh, Rosa Jimenez. Lots more people's names you're seeing on this website, right? You go down here, 240 innocent people from prison. Uh, and then down here at the very bottom, notice uh, New York address here, okay? And then this is, uh, the Innocence Project is affiliated with Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, Yeshiva University. Okay, so there's that. Okay, now let's just scroll back up here. And then let's go to, let's see, news, articles. And then we just see here, you know, who is, topics, all articles. Um, again, not really seeing anything here, but hold, you know, hold on. Here. Oh, oh, what's this? Scott Peterson case in California statement. Interesting. Let's click that and see what it says. Statement on developments in the Scott Peterson case in California. This was January 19th, 2024. On January 18th, 2024, the Los Angeles Innocence Project, underlined, filed motion seeking DNA testing and post-conviction discovery on behalf of its client, Scott Peterson. Any and all inquiries about Mr. Peterson case should be directed to the Los Angeles Innocence Project, a nonprofit organization wholly independent of the Innocence Project. Very interesting, but notice they have it. Now it's an open case, obviously, or whatever, but nothing really going on there, right? So I found that interesting. Now let's get to the juicy stuff. Can you see the little screen recording up here? We have a few different things here. So Innocence Project New Orleans, uh, 4.6 star review, Mid-Atlantic, uh, five star. Los Angeles Innocence Project, 2.8. Huh, something seems to be really knocking that number down. Let's investigate. So here we go, Los Angeles, yes, this does appear to be it. Let's see what these reviews say. Okay, not looking good. Let's see, five days ago. Okay, let's see here. So the LA Innocence Project is using funds and time to defend Scott Peterson. This is so disappointing. Is there are other people that could use your services? I guess you have to be white and famous, disgusting. Okay, the next one says, Thank you so much for fighting justice. This was two days ago. Unbelievable. These people that know nothing about trial facts, corrupt jurors, and unfair trial want to crash your rating. Thank you for fighting for attempting to fix our extremely flawed legal system. There are many of us that can use a brain cell and thankful for your fight. Okay. Now this next one from Megan says, this establishment is in no way affiliated with the dedicated Innocence Project organization. They have taken their namesake for the same reason they have actively chosen to re-traumatize an innocent victim's family for financial gain and clout okay then jacob says keep up the hard work it's not always right what's what is right is not always popular twitter trolls going to troll but they have years no decades of a documented history of taking cases they believe will win more research before completely wasting donated money on Scott Peterson. Uh, the next one says an embarrassment to the name of Innocence Project to use your limited resources to support a family annihilator, Scott Peterson. Never seen a more obvious case of uh, M. I hope you can reconsider your support with this individual, and I hope that until you do, you will see a severe reduction in your funding. And then more one-star reviews, so on and so forth. So, as you can tell, people are not happy about this. And here's my thing you know again with the scott peterson thing you know my take on it is i personally think he's guilty you know i just i i just do was i there no was i on the jury no was i on the police force no so there's that right i'm just somebody sitting at home with an opinion okay it means absolutely nothing if they do all this and it turns out that bam we found this other thing well then okay great like i said my whole thing is i can't get past the things i mentioned before so I think personally with the LA Innocence Project taking this on, well, one thing I was like, what if they are doing reverse trolling? What if they are like, we think he's guilty, but we're going to put an end to this once and for all and do this testing to prove it again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was like, what if they're like ultimately trolling him doing this? Okay. But again, these questions are there and you know, 
I think it's interesting that Innocence Project is like, ah, these are over here. That's not us, right? This is somebody different. So because there was that whole confusion, even when I first saw this, I was like, the Innocence Project took this on? You know what I mean? I was like, really? I, I was very surprised. So then when I was like, oh, wait a second, here we go. You know, and who knows? I mean, you know, I've read a lot of comment like on Reddit and stuff like that of people basically being like, look, this is obviously just something to get in the press, to get some clout, to get funding, to get this kind of stuff, to put their name out there, maybe even get a documentary, that kind of thing. One would hope not, right? I mean, one would hope not. One would hope that if they're going to do this, there's a true belief on their part that this man might be innocent, right? Regardless of personal feelings about it. Because in this day and age where everything's a documentary, everything's a Netflix series, you know, it's like we don't need one more, especially at the end of the day when there are victims in the case and it re-traumatizes the families, right? Because this puts them to a whole new thing where it's just like, seriously? But again, when this all comes out, if it's laid to rest of, mm, yep, sorry, this proves that he, it's, it's, we're back to ground zero of his guilt. Then I'm curious what everybody has to say then so there's that and i'm curious what you have to say as well so let me know in the comment section first of all and again this is one of those cases that divides people so we can all agree to disagree here kind of a thing i'm curious to know do you think he's innocent or guilty and why like what are the things that you say this is why i think he's uh not guilty this is why i think he's guilty uh you know i said mine you know i, I just can't get around the fact of the inconsistencies in his story we'll call them and the conveniences of his alibi and then where Lacey turned up and where he was at you know all this so i'm curious what you think anyways that's it if you're still watching i do appreciate it roscoe oh he's he's sleeping now he did ask in dream world to drop some sofas in the comment section Anyways, until he and I, well, he wakes up and then I carry him and we skedaddle down to the comment section to talk about this case and others, we'll see y'all soon. I just wanted to say thank you again for watching the whole video and also thank you for being part of the Sofa Squad. Special thanks to all the Patreon members, channel members from both of my channels, everybody who likes, shares, subscribes, comments in the comment sections. It helps the channel out so much. Now don't forget, I do have that other channel, the podcast channel. That's where we go live, we hang out, we talk. Uh, we have kind of sort of a schedule, but just be sure and check it out. I'll put it up here on the screen. Also, if you're looking for merch, be sure to check out my Teespring store. I'll put Put that up here and then like i said in the beginning of the video if you want to follow me and roscoe on the insta on the gram on the instagram go on check it out it's right here on the screen again but once again thank you very much i really appreciate you being part of the sofa squad and i'll see you in the next video